The Voice of Russia World Service presents another edition of the Voice of Russia Treasure Store. This program was prepared at the request of our listeners who take interest in works by the great Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky. Today we offer you a radio version of his famous novel Crime and Punishment. The novel was published for the first time in 1866. Its plot and main idea were described by Fyodor Dostoevsky himself in a letter to the editor of the magazine Ruski Vesnik Mikhail Katkov. Here is what the author wrote in his letter. The idea of the novel does not conflict with your magazine in any way. This is a psychological report of a crime committed in our days. A young man a student expelled from university, born in a humble family and living in abject poverty, succumbed to some inconclusive ideas floating in the air because of his light-mindedness and feigned concepts. He decided to find a way out of his predicament at a stroke. He decided to kill an old woman who lent money at an interest. The old woman was foolish, Deaf, sick, and greedy. She charged a high interest. She was wicked. She tormented her younger sister, making her work as a servant to her. She is no good. What does she live for? Is she of any use to anyone? And so on. These questions throw the young man into confusion. He decides to kill her, to rob her, in order to make happy his mother, who lives in the province, and free his sister, who lives as a companion in a family of landowners, from the lusty advances of the head of the family, advances threatening her with peril. He wants to finish his university, go abroad, and then spend his life as an honest man, firm and swerving in doing his humane duty to mankind, which would make up for his crime. But after the murder, the psychological process of the crime begins to unfold. Insolvable questions rise in the assassin's mind. Unexpected feelings torment his heart. God's truth and earthly justice gain the upper hand, and he ends in feeling compelled to report on himself. He feels compelled to rejoin humanity even at the cost of perishing in penal servitude. The sense of being alienated from mankind that he felt as soon as he had committed his crime was insupportable. The law, truth and human nature gained the upper hand. The criminal decided to accept punishment to expiate his guilt. Besides, my novel includes the hint that the juridical punishment for the crime is much less fearful to the wrongdoer than legislators think, partially because he demands it morally himself. Now that Fyodor Dostoevsky himself has explained the contents and the main idea of his novel, let's hear its radio version. I'll remind you that the novel is called Crime and Punishment. Raskolnikov was remarkably handsome, with beautiful dark eyes and dark chestnut-colored hair. He was taller than average, slim and well-built. His room was situated right under the roof of a tall five-story tenement and sooner resembled a closet than a place of habitation. His landlady from whom he rented this room with dinner and a maid, lived on the floor below in a separate apartment. And each time he wanted to go down to the street, he had to pass 
his landlady's kitchen, the door of which was nearly always wide open onto the stairs. And each time as he passed it, the young man had a morbid sensation of fear, of which he was ashamed and which caused him to frown. He was heavily in debt to his landlady and was afraid of running into her. Not that he was particularly timid or cowed, quite the opposite indeed, but for some time now he had been in a tense, irritated state of mind that verged upon hypochondria. So absorbed in himself had he grown, so isolated from anyone else, that he was actually afraid of meeting anyone at all, not simply his landlady. He had been crushed by poverty. So poorly dressed was he that another man, even one inured to such a style of living, would have been ashamed to go out into the street during the daytime in such rags. However, this particular district was of such a kind that it would have been difficult to surprise anyone by one's manner of dress. The local population, which was for the most part made up of tradesmen and craftsmen, and huddled together in these streets and lanes of St. Petersburg Centre, sometimes enlivened the general panorama with such picturesque subjects, it would have been odd for anyone to be surprised at encountering the occasional freak. But by this time, so much vicious contempt had built up in the young man's soul that in spite of all his sometimes very youthful finickiness, he was least ashamed of his rags while out on the streets. It would have been another matter had he run into people he knew or any of his erstwhile students' colleagues, whom in general he hated meeting at all times. At the beginning of July, during a spell of exceptionally hot weather, Fyodor Raskolnikov came down onto the street from his little room and slowly set off for the pawnbroker, Alyona Ivanovna. She was a tiny, dried-up little old woman of about sixty, with sharp, hostile eyes, a small, sharp nose, and no head covering. Her whitish hair, which had not much grey in it, was abundantly smeared with oil. Wound round her long, thin neck, which resembled the leg of a chicken, was an old, nondescript flannel rag. And from her shoulders, the heat notwithstanding, hung an utterly yellowed and moth-eaten fur jacket. Every moment or so, the old woman coughed and groaned. Fyodor knew that he had to take 730 paces to reach the front entrance of the pawnbroker's house. He had somehow managed to count them once. What he was actually doing now was going to perform a rehearsal of his undertaking. And with every step, his excitement mounted higher and higher. His heart standing still, a nervous tremor running through him, he approached an enormous tenement where the old woman lived. The young man immediately slipped unnoticed through the front entrance and up a staircase to the right. The staircase was dark and narrow, a back stair. But he was already familiar with all this, had studied it, and on the whole the setting appealed to him. In darkness like this, an inquisitive glance would hold no risk. If I'm so scared as this now, what would I be like if I were really to go ahead with my plan? <coughs> Who are you? My name is Raskolnikov. I'm a student. I came to see you about a month ago. Ah, uh, I remember it, dearie. I remember your visit very well. 
So, you see, I'm here again about the same thing. <coughs> In you go, dearie. The little room into which the young man passed, with its yellow wallpaper, its geraniums, and its muslin curtains, was at that moment brightly illuminated by the setting sun. So the sun will be shining like this then, too. With a swift glance, he took in everything in the room, in order as far as possible to study and remember its position. Everything was very clean. Both furniture and floors had been scrubbed and polished until they shone. There was not a speck of dust to be found in the whole apartment. It's the sort of cleanliness you generally find in the homes of sour old widows. Now what's your business? I I've got something I want to pawn. Here, look. Silver watch. But you haven't redeemed the thing you pawned last time yet. Your time limit ran out two days ago. I'll pay you another month's interest. Be patient. Dearie, it's up to me whether I'm patient or whether I sell what you pawned this very day. Uh, how much will they give me for the watch, Alona Ivanovna? <laughs> well, dearie, you come to me with such rubbish. It's practically worthless. I let you have two tickets for that ring last time. And you could buy a new one at a jeweler's for a ruble fifty. Let, let me have four. I promise I'll redeem it. It belonged to my father. I'm expecting some money soon. A ruble fifty and the interest in advance. That's the best I can do. A ruble fifty? Well, it's up to you. All right. Go on, then. The old woman reached into her pocket for her keys and went behind the curtain into the other room. Left alone in the middle of the room, the young man listened curiously, trying to work out what she was doing. He could hear her unlocking the chest of drawers. It must be the top drawer, so she keeps her keys in her right-hand pocket all in one bunch, on a steel ring. And there is one key there that's bigger than all the others, three times the size, with a notch beat. It can't be the one to the chest drawers, obviously. So there must be some kind of box or chest in there, too. God, how dishonorable all this is! <coughs> Now then, dearie, the interest in percent a month. So, on a ruble fifty, you owe me fifteen kopecks, payable in advance. You also owe me twenty kopecks on the two rubles you had before. That comes to thirty-five kopecks. So, what you get for your watch is a ruble fifteen. And here you are. What? It's down to ruble fifteen now, is it? That's right, dearie. The young man did not attempt to argue and took the money. He looked at the old woman and made no sign of being in a hurry to leave, as though there was something else he wanted to say or do, but did not himself quite know what it was. I may bring you, Alena Ivanovna, something else, in a day or two. An item of silver, good quality, a cigarette case, as soon as I get it back from a friend of mine. We'll talk about it when you come again, dearie. Goodbye, then. I say, do you spend all the time alone here? Isn't your sister around? Um, uh, and what would you be wanting with her, dearie? Oh, nothing in particular. I was simply asking. I mean, just now, you... Goodbye, Elena Ivanovna.
Raskolnikov went out feeling decidedly confused. The confusion got worse and worse. As he descended the stairs, he even stopped several times, as though he had been struck by some sudden thought. And at last, when he was out on the street, he exclaimed, Oh God, how loathsome all this is. And could I really, could I really? No, it's nonsensical. It's absurd. Could I really ever have contemplated such a monstrous act? It shows what filth my heart is capable of, though. Yes, that's what it is. Filthy, mean, vile, vile. And for a whole month I've been... He could find neither words nor exclamations with which to give voice to his disturbed state of mind. The sense of infinite loathing that had begun to crush and sicken his heart, even while he had been only on his way to the old woman, had now attained such dimensions and become so vividly conscious, he was quite simply overwhelmed by his depression. He moved along the pavement like a drunkard, not noticing the passers-by, knocking into them, and only recovered himself when he reached the next street. Looking round, he observed that he was standing beside a drinking den. He wanted some cold beer, all the more so since he attributed his state of debility to the fact that he had had nothing in his stomach. In a dark and dirty corner, he found himself a seat at a sticky little table, asked for some beer and drank his first glass of it with avid greed. The relief he experienced was total and immediate, and his thoughts brightened. <laughs> this is all a lot of nonsense. There was no need for me to get into such a flap. It was just physical exhaustion. One glass of beer, a piece of dried bread, and in a single moment the mind gains strength, one's thoughts grow lucid and one's intentions firm. <laughs> what trivial rubbish all of this is! He already looked cheerful, as if he had suddenly freed himself from some terrible burden, and cast his eyes round at other people there in a friendly manner. But even as he did so, he had a distant sense that all this optimism was also morbid. Sitting almost side by side with him at another table were a student, whom he did not know at all and whose face he did not remember, and a young officer. They had been playing billiards and were now drinking tea. Suddenly, he heard the student telling the officer about the pawnbroker, Alyona Ivanovna, the collegiate secretary's widow, and giving her a dress. This alone seemed somehow strange to Raskolnikov. There he was, having just come from there, and now the first people he met were talking about her. It was merely a coincidence, of course, but even so, he was now unable to get rid of a certain, very peculiar feeling. She's amazing. You can always get money out of her. She could let you have 5,000 straight off. Yet she won't turn her nose up even at a ruble pledge. A lot of us have been to see her. Only she's a horrible old cow. Capricious and mean. One needs only to be one day late in redeeming one's pledge for the thing to be lost. She would give one-fourth of the item's value and take monthly interest of five and even seven percent. She has a sister called Lizaveta. She beats her every minute of the day and keeps her at beck and call. I'd murder that old woman and rob of her all her money, and I swear to you, I'd do it without the slightest twinge of conscience. Mm, let me ask you a serious question now. I was... I was joking just now, of course, but look. 
On the one hand, you have a nasty, stupid, worthless, meaningless, sick old woman who's no use to anyone. Indeed, she's actually harmful to people. She doesn't even know herself why she's alive. And who's going to go off and die anyway? You see my gist, do you? Yes, I think I do. Listen to this, then. Here, on the other hand, you have young, gifted people that are going to waste away for want of money. Thousands of them everywhere. A hundred, a thousand good deeds and undertakings that could be arranged and made possible with that old hag's money. Dozens of families saved from poverty, breakup, ruin, depravity, venereal hospitals, and all of that with her money. If one were to kill her, take her money, and use it to serve all mankind and the common cause, what do you think? Wouldn't one petty little crime like that be justified by all those thousands of good deeds? Instead of one life, thousands of lives rescued from corruption and decay. No more than the life of a louse, a cockroach. And it's not even worth that, because she's a nasty old thing. She's wearing another person's life out. She's mean. She bit Lizavetta's finger out of meanness the other day. She almost bit it off. Of course, she doesn't deserve to live. But then that's nature. Nature should be corrected and channeled, you know. Otherwise, we would all just drown in a sea of preconceived morals. If it weren't for that, there would never have been a single great man. People say duty, conscience. Well, I won't say a word against duty and conscience, but after all, what do we mean by them? Wait, I want to ask you another question. Listen. No, I want to ask you a question. First, you listen. Well? Well, here you're talking and holding forth in that oratorical way of yours. But tell me, are you going to kill that old woman? Of course not. I uh, merely thought it would be her just deserts. It's not up to me. Well, the way I see it is that there are no just deserts in it at all, unless you're prepared to do it yourself. Now, let's go and have another game of billiards. of extreme excitement. Why had he chanced to hit upon such talk and such ideas precisely now, when inside his own head there had just been engendered precisely those very same thoughts? This coincidence seemed to him a strange one. This trivial eating house conversation had an extremely strong influence on him during the subsequent development of the affair, as though here some form of predestination, of augury, had been at work. fourth floor. Here was the door. He was panting. For a single instant there passed through his head the thought Shouldn't I just go away? But he left his own question unanswered and began listening at the old woman's door. Dead silence. Then he listened on the stairs again listened long and carefully. After that, he looked around the last time, pulled himself up together, straightened himself, and again tested the axe in its loop 
under the coat. Don't I look terribly pale? Don't I look awful agitated? She's suspicious. Shouldn't I wait a bit more until my heart has quietened down? But his heart did not quieten down. On the contrary, as if by design, it proceeded to beat harder and harder and harder. He could not endure it. Slowly, he stretched out his hand to the bell and rang it. Hello, Alona Ivanovna. I've, I've brought you something, but look, we'd better go over there, where it's light. Good Lord, where are you going? What do you want? What are you? What's your business? What are you staring at me like this for? As if you didn't recognize me. If you want it, take it. If not, I'll go to someone else. I haven't the time for this. Oh, but, but, but why did you suddenly fly off the handle like that, dearie? What have you got there? A, a silver cigarette case. You know, the one I told you about last time. But why are you so pale? Look, your hands are shaking. Have you come out of a bath, dearie? It's fever. One can't help looking pale if one doesn't get anything to eat. He was barely able to get the words out. His strength was failing him again, but the reply had sounded convincing. The old woman took the pledge from him, weighing it in her hand. <coughs> what is it? Something I want to pawn, a cigarette case, a silver one. Take a look. <clears throat> Funny shaped thing. Doesn't feel like silver to me either. Wrapped it up well, haven't you? As she attempted to untie the ribbon, she turned towards the window in search of more light. All the windows in her apartment were closed in spite of the stifling heat. And for a few seconds, she moved right away and stood with her back to him. He undid his coat and freed the axe from its loop, but did not take it right out, merely held it in place with his right hand under the garment. His hands were horribly weak. With each moment that passed, he could feel them grow ever more numb and wooden. He was scared he would lose his grip on the axe and drop it, Suddenly, his head started to go round. Why on earth has he wrapped it like this? The old woman moved a little way towards him. There was not another second to be lost. He took the axe right out, swung it up in both hands, barely conscious of what he was doing, and almost without effort, almost mechanically, brought the butt of it down on the old woman's head. At that moment, he had practically no strength left. But as soon as he brought the axe down, new strength was born within him. <coughs> the blow landed smack on the crown of her head, something made easy by her smallness. She sank in a heap to the floor, though even then she managed to raise both arms to her head. In one hand, she was still holding the pledge. At that point, with all his might, he landed her another blow, and another, each time with a butt, and each time on the crown of the head. The blood gushed out, as from an upturned glass, and her body collapsed backwards. He stepped back, allowed her to fall, and at once bent down over her face. She was dead. Her eyes were goggling out of her head, as though they might burst from it, while her forehead and all the rest of her features were crumpled and distorted in a convulsive spasm. He put the axe on the floor 
beside the dead woman, and at once began to feel inside her pocket, trying not to get the welling blood on his hand. The same bright pocket from which she had taken her keys the last time he'd been there. He was in full possession of his faculties. He had no blackouts or dizziness now, but his hands were still shaking. Later, he remembered he had actually been very careful and thorough, doing his utmost not to get any blood on himself. He took the keys at once, as on the previous occasion. They were all in one bunch, all on a single steel ring. He ran at once into the bedroom with them, where a chest of drawers stood against one of the walls. It was a strange thing. Hardly had he begun to fit the keys to the lock of the chest of drawers, hardly had he heard their clinking, that a convulsive shiver seemed to run through him. Once again, he suddenly felt like abandoning the whole undertaking and going away. But this only lasted for a moment. It was too late for him to go. He even smiled an ironic smile at himself. Suddenly, he noticed there was a thin piece of cord around her neck. He tugged at it, but it was strong and did not break. It was moreover soaked in blood. With difficulty, and after some two minutes of fiddling about, in the course of which he got blood both on his hands and on the axe, he managed to sever the cord without touching the body with the axe, and it pulled out. He had not been mistaken; it was her purse. It was filled very tightly. Raskolnikov stuffed it in his pocket and rushed back into the bedroom. He was in a frantic hurry. He grabbed the keys and again began to fuss with them, but he met with no success. None of them would fit in any of the locks. It was not that his hands were shaking all that badly now, but rather that he kept making the wrong decisions. He remembered that the large key, the one with the serrated bit which was dangling there, along with all the smaller ones, could not possibly belong to the chest of drawers, but must fit some small trunk or chest, and that possibly in that everything lay hidden. He abandoned the chest of drawers and got down under the bed, since he was aware that in old women's dwellings. That is the place where such boxes are usually kept. So it was. The serrated key fit perfectly, and opened it. On top, there seemed to be nothing but rags, but as soon as he moved the pile of rags, a gold watch slipped out from under the hairskin coat. He fell upon things in a rush to turn them over. It really was so. Intermingled with the rags were objects made of gold, which were doubtless all the pledges. Wasting no time, he began to stuff them into the pockets of his trousers and overcoat, without investigating or opening any of the parcels and cases. But he did not manage to take many. He sat, squatting by the chest, and waited, scarcely breathing. Then he leapt up, grabbed the axe, and ran from the bedroom. In the middle of the room stood Lizaveta, with a large bundle in her hands, staring in rigid horror at her murdered sister, her face as white as a handkerchief. She was apparently unable to utter a sound. As she saw him run out, she began to quiver like a leaf, with a mild shudder, and her features worked spasmodically. She raised one arm, began to open her mouth, but still could not get out a scream, and began to slowly back away from him into the corner, staring at him fixedly.
but still without uttering a sound, as though she had not sufficient breath to do so. He rushed at her with the axe. The blow landed right on her skull, blade first, and instantly split open the whole upper part of her forehead, almost to the crown of her head. She fairly crashed to the floor. Raskolnikov began to lose his nerve completely. He seized hold of her bundle, threw it down again, and ran into the hallway. Terror was gaining an increasing hold of him, particularly after the second, quite unpremeditated murder. He felt he wanted to escape from this place as quickly as possible. Even so, when he took a look in the kitchen and caught sight of a half-full pail of water on a bench, he hit upon the notion of giving his hands and the axe a good wash. His hands were covered in blood, his fingers were stuck together. He lowered the axe straight into the water, blade first, grabbed a small piece of soap lying in a broken saucer on the windowsill, and began to wash his hands right there in the pail. When they were clean, he pulled out the axe, gave the iron part of it a thorough rinsing, and spent a long time, about three minutes, cleaning the wooden shaft, on which a good deal of blood had gathered, using the soap to get rid of it. After that, he wiped everything down with some of the washing that was hanging up to dry on the clothesline, strung up across the kitchen, and made a, a long and attentive examination of the axe over by the window. Not a vestige remained. The shaft was still damp. That was all. Carefully, he put the axe back into the loop inside his coat. Then, as far as the dim light of the kitchen would allow, he examined the coat, his trousers and boots. On a first superficial glance, there appeared to be nothing to worry about. Only the boots showed some stains. He soaked his rag in the water and rubbed the boots down. A dark, tormenting thought rising up inside him, the thought that he was behaving like a madman and that he was not at that moment in a position either to think properly or to protect himself. That what he was doing now was not at all what he ought to be doing. Oh my God, I must flee, flee. He rushed into the entrance hall. He was on the point of making his exit when suddenly he heard footsteps. The footsteps were nearing. He suddenly roused himself and managed to slip back quietly and deftly out of the passage and into the apartment again, closing the door behind him. Then he gripped the bolt and quietly, soundlessly slid it into its fastening. When he'd finished these preparations, he hid, scarcely breathing, right behind the door. What's wrong with them in there? Are they asleep or has somebody strangled them? The cursed wretches! Hey! Alona Ivanovna, you old witch! Elizabeth Ivanovna, my fabled beauty! Open up! <laughs> the cursed wretches. Are they sleeping or what? Is there really no one in? Hello, Koch. The devil only knows what they're up to in there. I've practically smashed the lock to bits. Hey, may I inquire how you know my name? I like that. Hey, I'd beat you at billiards three times in a row at the Gambrinus the day before yesterday. Ah, <laughs> yeah. So they are not in. Funny. It's damn silly, in fact. Where would an old woman like her be off to? I've got business with her. I, too, my dear fellow, I, too, have business with her. Well, what's to be done? Go back again, I suppose? Damn. And there was I, thinking... 
I'd get some money. That's right, that's right. There's, there's no point hanging around here. But why go and fix an appointment? She herself actually fixed an appointment with me. I mean, it's not exactly on my usual route. Where the devil can she have gone getting off to? That's what I cannot understand. All year round, she sticks at home, moping the old witch, telling you how her legs ache and how suddenly now she's off for a walk. Could we ask the yard keeper? Ask him what? Hmm, the devil having to ask. I mean, she never goes anywhere. The devil, there's nothing to be done. Let's go. Uh, well, seems we have to. Wait, wait. Look, do you see the way the door catches when you pull it? So? That means it isn't locked, but only bolted on the hook, in other words. Listen, can't you hear the bolt clinking? So? So what's your problem? It means that one of them's at home. If they had both gone out, they'd have locked the door from the outside using the key, not bolted it from inside. There, you hear the bolt clinking? For the bolt to be fastened inside like that, there would have to be somebody in there. They must be there, but they are not opening up. Do you see what I mean? Well, I never... Now that you come to mention it, I do. Then, what are they up to in there? There is something fishy here. I mean, you have rung the bell, you have rattled the door, yet they didn't open up. That means either they have fainted, or... Or, or what? I tell you what. Let's go and find the yard keeper. Let him winkle them out. Hey, that's a deal. They went away. Raskolnikov undid the bolt. Opened the door a little way. Heard nothing. And suddenly, quite without thinking now, went outside. Closed the door as tightly as he could and rushed off downwards. There was no one on the staircase. Nor anyone in the entrance, either. He walked through it. And turned left along the street. Not fully conscious, he walked through the gateway of the building where he lived. He remembered about the axe. He had to carry out a vital task to put the axe back in the yard keeper's room and in as inconspicuous a manner as possible. But it all went off without a hitch. The door of the yard keeper's room was set ajar, but not fixed with a lock. The yard keeper was absent, and he managed to put the axe back in its former place under the bench, even screening it with a log as before. No one, not a single soul did he meet after that on his way up to his room. The landlady's door was closed. Entering his quarters, he threw himself on the sofa without taking his coat off, just as he was. He did not sleep, but lay in a kind of oblivion. If anyone had come into the room, he would have leapt up instantly with a yell. The rags and tatters of vague thoughts swarmed in his head, but he could not seize hold of a single one of them, could not focus on a single one of them, even though he tried to force himself to. Having been introduced, Raskolnikov bowed to the master of the premises, who stood in the middle of the room and was looking at them inquiringly, extended his hand and shook that of his host. Parfiri Petrovich was dressed for a day at home, in a dressing gown, a spotlessly clean shirt and a pair of downed heel slippers. He was a man about thirty-five, slightly below average in height, 
well fed with even a slight paunch. Clean shaven with neither moustache nor side whiskers. The hair closely cropped on his large round head which somehow bulged with a special prominence at the rear. As soon as Parfiri Petrovich heard that his guest had a small item of business to discuss with him, he lost no time in asking him to sit down on the sofa. In a few brief, coherent words, Raskolnikov gave a clear and precise explanation of the matter, and was so pleased with himself that he even managed to take a good look at Parfiri. Parfiri Petrovich likewise did not remove his eyes from him during all the time he talked. Then, with a thoroughly business-like air, he replied, What you should do, sir, is make a statement to the police. What you say is that, having learned of such and such an occurrence, this murder, in other words, you, in your turn, wish to inform the investigator in charge of the case that such and such objects are items of your possession and that you wish to redeem them. Oh, something of that sort. Uh, as a matter of fact, they'll write it for you. Um, you see, uh, the thing is that just at this moment I'm right out of cash and I can't even find the small change that would be necessary. What I'd like to do, you see, is simply make a declaration that these objects are mine and that when I have the money... Oh, that doesn't make any difference, sir, but if you like, you can simply write directly to me as saying something to the same effect, uh, namely that having learned of such and such and wishing to make a declaration concerning such and such items of your possession, your request... Can I write it on ordinary paper? Oh, on the most ordinary you wish, sir. He knows everything. You must forgive me for bothering you with such a trivial matter. Those things of mine aren't worth more than five roubles altogether, but they're particularly dear to me as a memory of those from whom I received them. I must confess that when I found out about it, I felt very alarmed. My mother came to see me, and if she were to find out that the watch had been lost, she'd be in despair. Women. So, your mother came to see you, did she? Yes. When would that be now, sir? Uh, yesterday evening. Your things can't possibly have got lost. I've been waiting for you to get here for ages. What? Waiting? You mean you knew what I'd pawned? Both of your articles, the ring and the watch, were found in her apartment, wrapped up in the same piece of paper, with your name clearly marked in pencil on it, together with the date she received them from you. <laughs> How come you're so observant? Uh, I said that just now because uh, there must have been an awful lot of people who'd pawned things. So many that it must have been hard for you to remember who they all were. Yet you seem to remember them all quite clearly. And, uh, and, stupid, clumsy, why did I put that in? Ah, practically all of those who'd pawned anything are now known to us, and... You are the only one who hasn't been so good as to oblige. Uh, I've not been entirely well. I've heard about that too, sir. I also heard that you've been very upset about something. Why, even now you look pale. I'm not pale at all. There is absolutely nothing the matter with me. But if I behave aggressively, I'll give myself away. Oh, why are they tormenting me? You must be sick of me by now, eh? Oh, for heaven's sake, sir, not at all, not at all. If you only knew the interest you arouse in me. It's so fascinating to watch and listen. Indeed, I must confess I'm delighted you've been so good as to do me the honor at last. 
What about tea? Porfiri Petrovich went off to order tea. The thoughts were spinning around in Raskolnikov's head like a whirlwind. He was horribly overstimulated. What's clear above all is that he doesn't bother to cover anything up. Stand upon ceremony. It can only mean that he doesn't even want to conceal the fact that he's following me like a pack of dogs. Go on. Why don't you just hit me straight out? Stop playing this cat and mouse game. I mean, it's offensive. Porfiry Petrovich, and in any case, I may not let you go on with it. I'll get up and blurt out the whole truth to the lot of you, right in your ugly mugs. And there'll you see what contempt I have for you. But what if it only seems this way to me? What if it's a mirage and I'm wrong about everything? What if I'm simply getting aggressive because of my... In experience, my inability to sustain the shabby role I'm acting. Perhaps he doesn't mean anything by all these remarks. All the things he's saying are perfectly ordinary. Yet there is something else there too. There are all the kind of things one may say at any time. Yet there are more to it. Why is he using that tone? Yes, that's what it is. Down. Did Perfiri wink at me or didn't he? Oh, it's probably rubbish. Why would he wink at me? What is he trying to do? Get on my nerves? Or is he teasing me? By this holy mirage or else he... he knows. Oh, I wish he'd hurry up and get it all over with. Why did I come? God, how irritable I feel. Perhaps that's just as well, the role of the invalid. He's testing me. He'll try to throw me off balance. Why did I come here? Porfiry Petrovich returned. He seemed suddenly to have become more cheerful. You know, a certain little article written by you has been of constant interest to me on crime or something it was called. I can't remember the title now. But I had the pleasure of reading it two months ago in the periodical leader. An article by me? In the periodical leader? It's true I did write one about six months ago after I left the university. It was a review of a book but I wrote it for the newspaper, the weekly leader, not the periodical. Well, the uh, periodical is where it ended up. But I mean, the weekly leader went out of circulation. That's why it was never printed. That's true, sir. But when out of circulation, the weekly leader was incorporated into the periodical leader. And so, two months ago, your article appeared... In the periodical leader. Didn't you know? No, I didn't. For goodness sake, why, you can request payment for that article. What a peculiar character you are. You live such a cloistered existence that you don't have the faintest notion about matters that concern you personally. I mean, it's a fact, sir. Uh, but how did you know the article was by me? There was nothing but an initial at the bottom of it. Oh, I found out by chance, just the other day, actually. Through the editor, he is an acquaintance of mine. I was very interested. Um, let's see now. My article was about the psychological state of a criminal's mind throughout the entire process of committing his crime, wasn't it? Yes, sir. And you insisted that the enactment of a crime is invariably accompanied by illness. Most, most original. But that wasn't actually the part of your little article that interested me so much. It was rather 
a certain idea that you introduced at the end of the piece, but which you unfortunately alluded to only in passing you obscurely. In short, if you remember, you make a certain allusion to the idea that there may exist in the world certain persons who are able, or rather, who are not only able, but have a perfect right to commit all sorts of atrocities and crimes, and that it's as if the law did not apply to them. See, the whole point of your article is that the human race is divided into the ordinary and the extraordinary. The ordinary must live in obedience and do not have the right to break the law because, well, because they are ordinary, you see. The extraordinary, on the other hand, have the right to commit all sorts of crimes and break the law in all sorts of ways, precisely because they are extraordinary. That's more or less what you wrote, isn't it? If I'm not mistaken? No, that's not quite what I wrote. Actually, I will admit that you've given an almost correct account of my idea, even a completely correct one, if you like. The only point of difference is that I don't at all insist that extraordinary people are in all circumstances unfailingly bound and obliged to commit all sorts of atrocities, as you put it. Indeed, I didn't even think that an article which said that would be allowed into print. No, all I did was quite simply to allude to the fact that an extraordinary person has the right, not an official right, of course, but a private one, to allow his conscience to step across certain obstacles, and then, only if the execution of his idea, which may occasionally be the salvation of all mankind, requires it, you say that my article is obscure. I am prepared to explain it to you to the best of my ability. I think I may not be mistaken in supposing that that is what you would like me to do. Very likely. Be it so. My central idea consists in the notion that, by the law of their nature, human beings in general, may be divided into two categories. A lower one, that of the ordinary, that is to say, raw material, which serves exclusively to bring into being more like itself. And another group of people who possess a gift or talent for saying something new, in their own milieu. There are within these categories infinite subdivisions, of course, but the distinguishing features of each are quite clearly marked. The people of the first category, the raw material, that is, are in general conservative by nature, sedate, live lives of obedience and like to be obeyed. In my view, they have a duty to be obedient, as that is their function, and there is really nothing about this that is degrading to them. The second category, all break the law, are destroyers or have a tendency that way, depending on their abilities. The crimes of these people are, of course, relative and multifarious. For the most part, what they are demanding, in highly varied forms, is the destruction of the present reality in the name of one that is better. But if such a person finds it necessary, for the sake of the idea, to step over a dead body, over a pool of blood, then he is able, within his own conscience, to give himself permission to do so, always having regard to the nature of the idea and its dimensions, note that. 
It's only in this sense alone that I speak in my article of their right to crime. You'll remember that we started off with the discussion of a legal question. Oh, yes, yes. Go on. The masses are almost never prepared to acknowledge them this right. They flog them or hang them, more or less, thereby quite correctly exercising their conservative function. The only slightly odd thing being that in subsequent generations these same masses put on a pedestal the people they've flogged or executed and pay homage to them, more or less. Those of the first category are always the lords of the present, while those of the second category are the lords of the future. The first can serve the world and increase its population. The second move the world and lead it towards a goal. Both one and the other have a completely equal right to exist. But there's just one thing. I'm going back to what you were saying just now. I mean, they don't always flog them or hang them. I, I mean, extraordinary people. In fact, some of them come out on top in their own lifetime? Oh, yes, some of them get what they want while they're still alive, and then... They themselves start flogging and executing people. If they have to. And, you know, that's exactly what most of them do. <laughs> on the whole, your remark is rather a witty one. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> now, uh, tell me this. How do you dis distinguish these extraordinary people from uh, the ordinary ones. You must forgive in me the natural anxiety of a, a practical and well-intentioned man, but I, I think you'd, you'd agree that if there were to be a mix-up and a person from one of the categories thought he belonged to the other and started to clear away all the obstacles, as you so neatly call them, I mean... Oh, that happens all the time. <laughs> that remark was even wittier than your last one. Oh, thank you, sir. But your central idea, I mean, uh, to condone the shedding of blood on grounds of conscience, is, in my opinion, more terrible than if it were to be permitted officially by law. Uh, none of that's actually in the article. It's merely alluded to... Quite so, sir, quite so. I think I've almost grasped the way in which you choose to view crime, sir. Well, and what about a criminal's conscience? If he has one, he'll suffer when he realizes the error of his ways. That's his punishment. That, in addition to penal servitude. Pain and suffering are inevitable for persons of broad awareness and depth of heart. The truly great are, in my view, always bound to feel a great sense of sadness during their time upon earth. Sir, you'll no doubt curse me for this, and it'll probably make you angry, but I simply cannot restrain myself. Please permit me to give expression to just one more little question. Very well. What I mean, sir, is that when you were writing your article, it couldn't just possibly have been, could it? <laughs> that you too considered yourself, oh, just the merest bit, to be one of the extraordinary people who can say a new word. In the sense you explained. I mean, is that the case, sir? And I wouldn't rule it out. And if that's the case, sir, then it is really possible that you might also have decided, oh, because of some everyday setback or financial difficulty, let's say, or because you wanted to further the interests of all humanity in some way, to step across an obstacle. Well, by robbing and murdering someone, for example. 
If I had, I certainly wouldn't tell you. Oh, but I mean, sir, you must understand. My interest stems solely from a desire to understand your article and is of a purely literary nature. Uh, please let me make it perfectly clear that I consider myself neither Mohammed nor a Napoleon, nor any of those other persons of that kind, and not being one of them, I am consequently unable to give you a satisfactory account of how I might have behaved. Oh, for heaven's sake! Who doesn't think he's a Napoleon among us in Russia these days? Raskolnikov said nothing and looked at Porfiry with a firm, fixed gaze. A moment of gloomy silence elapsed. Raskolnikov turned to go. Off? Already? Most, most glad to have made your acquaintance. Oh, about your application. Don't let anyone put you off. Just write at the why I told you. In fact, the best thing would be if you looked in to see me there in a day or two. Oh, why not tomorrow? You can be sure of finding me there at around eleven. We'll sort it all out. Have a bit of a talk. As one of the last people to have been there, you may be able to tell us a few things. You want to question me officially? With all the trappings? Oh, why would I? That's not at all required. For the time being. You took what I said the wrong way. You see... I never miss a chance, and and since I have already talked to all the people who had pawned things, taken statements from some of them, and you as the last person. But listen, uh, would it have been some time between seven and eight when you were there, sir? Yes, uh, between seven and eight. Well, between seven and eight that evening, as you were making your way up that staircase, didn't you see in the apartment on the second floor, the one that was unlocked and had its door open, remember? Two workmen, or at any rate, one of them. They were decorating in the... Didn't you notice? Now, this is very, very important for them. Decorators? No, 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 I didn't see them. No, I didn't see any decorators. And I don't think I noticed any unlocked apartment of that kind either. But on the fourth floor, I do remember there was a government clerk moving out of the apartment, opposite Alona Ivanovna's. I remember, I distinctly remember, that some soldiers were carrying some sort of sofa outside, and I remember being squeezed against the wall as they passed. But decorators, no, no, I don't remember. Parfiri Petrovich ushered Raskolnikov right to the door, with the utmost affability. Raskolnikov emerged onto the street. He was sullen and gloomy. Having walked several yards, he took a deep breath. With slow, dragging steps, his knees trembling, and for some reason feeling cold, Raskolnikov went back and climbed the stairs to his closet-like room. He took off his cap and put it on the table, and for about ten minutes stood next to it, motionless. Then, in exhaustion, he lay down on the sofa and stretched out on it painfully, uttering a weak moan. His eyes were closed. Thus he lay for about half an hour, he thought about nothing. To be sure, there were a few vague thoughts. A 
About another half hour went by. Raskolnikov opened his eyes and again threw himself back, clasping his hands behind his head. How could I have dared, knowing the person I am, knowing what it would do to me to take an axe and bloody my hands? I should have thought it out in advance. Oh, but I did. No, the real overlord, to whom all things are permitted, ransacks Toulon, commits a massacre in Paris, forgets an army in Egypt, throws away half a million men in his Moscow campaign, and talks his way out at Vilna with a clever remark. And after his death, they put up statues to him. And that means that everything is permitted to him. No, men like that don't have bodies, but lumps of bronze. <laughs> the old woman is rubbish. It's possible that the old woman was a mistake, but... She's not what it's all about in any case. The old woman was just an illness. I wanted to get my stepping over done as quickly as possible. It wasn't a person, but a principle that I killed. And I killed the principle, but I didn't step over it. I remained on this side of it. All I was able to do was to kill. And the way it's turning out, it seems I didn't even manage to do that. <laughs> oh, I'm an aesthetic class, that's what. Yes, that's what I am. A louse and nothing more. <laughs> if only because of the fact, for one thing, I'm now arguing the time allows, and because for another, throughout the whole of the past month I've been pasturing all beneficent providence by asking it to be a weakness that I wasn't undertaking my project in order to gratify my fleshly lust, but that I had in my mind a splendid and agreeable aim. <laughs> and finally I am allowed because, because I myself am possibly even more loathsome and disgusting than a squashed louse, and knew in advance that I'd tell myself this only after I'd squashed it. Is there a Anything that will stand in comparison with a monstrous plan such as that. Oh, the vulgarity of it. Oh, the baseness. Obey, trembling creature, and do not desire, because that is no business of yours. His hair was soaked with sweat. His lips, which had been quivering, were parched. His motionless gaze was fixed upon the ceiling. On the following morning, at 11 o'clock, he went to Parfiri Petrovich, to the district police station. On entering it, Raskolnikov found his way up to the criminal investigation department. There, he requested that Parfiri Petrovich be informed of his arrival. He was rather surprised that it took long for anyone to attend to him. Somehow, he had imagined they would fall upon him instantly. He suddenly felt himself trembling, and a sense of positive indignation seethed up in him at the thought that he was trembling with fear of the hated Parfiri Petrovich. 
The most horrible prospect he could think of was to encounter that man again. He hated him beyond all measure, beyond all bounds, to the point where he was actually afraid of somehow giving himself away by his hatred. So intense was that indignation that his trembling stopped at once. He prepared to enter with an air of cold insolence and made a vow to himself to say as little as possible, to keep his eyes and ears open and on this occasion at least concentrate the utmost effort on keeping his morbidly overstimulated temperament in check. At that very moment his name was called and he left the waiting room to enter Parfiri Petrovich's chambers. Ah, good sir. So here you are in our neck of the woods. Well, sit down, my dear fellow. Yes, right here on the sofa. I noticed that he stretched out both arms to me. But didn't let me shake his hand. Withdrew it in time. Both men were eyeing each other warily. But no sooner did their eyes meet than they would avert them with the swiftness of lightning. I've brought you that application about the watch. Look, here it is. Uh, have I written it correctly, or will I need to copy it out again? What? Oh, that letter. Yes, 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 yes. Have no fear. That will do perfectly. Yes, that will do perfectly, sir. No more than that is required. I think you said yesterday that you wanted to ask me some formal questions about how well I knew the woman who was murdered. Oh, why did I say I think? And why am I so worried about having said it? This is bad, bad. I'm going to say the wrong thing again. Yes, 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 yes. Now, please, don't let me put you to any bother. Everything is... Perfectly all right. We've all the time in the world, sir. All the time in the world. There's no hurry, sir. No hurry at all. Uh, I say, do you smoke? Got some of your own? Here, sir. Have one of mine. Well, I'm seeing you in here, but you know my own quarters are just through that partition there. They're provided for me by the government. You know, if you ask me, government quarters are a famous thing, eh? What do you think? Yes, they are. Yeah, a famous thing, a famous thing. Oh, yes, a famous thing. I know what I want to ask you. Uh, why? There exists, I believe, a certain legal maxim, a kind of legal technique, if you'd like, which is used by all state investigators and consists in starting the inquiry from some remote point, from some trivial matter or even from a serious one, as long as it's wholly irrelevant, in order, as it were, to give the person being questioned a certain kind of confidence or rather to make him feel at his ease, to allay his jumpiness. And then, suddenly hit him bang on his head, in a thoroughly unexpected way with the most fatal and dangerous question. Is it so? I've heard that this technique is mentioned in all the textbooks and manuals to this very day. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So, you think that's why I began talking to you about government quarters, do you, eh? <sighs> Porfiry Petrovich, yesterday you expressed the wish that I should come and see you in order that you might put certain questions to me. I have come as you required. And if there is anything you would like to ask me, then please do so. Otherwise you must forgive me if I leave. I don't have much time. There is a matter I must see to. I'm sick of all this, do you hear, sir? And have been so for a long time now. It's partly this that made me feel ill. In fact, to put it bluntly, to put it bluntly, be so good as either to ask your questions or let me go this instant. And if you are going to question me, then do it according to the proper form, sir. 
I shall not cooperate unless you do. And so I shall now say goodbye to you, as there seems to be nothing more for the two of us to discuss together. Great heavens above! What's all this you are going on about? What would I be doing questioning you? Please, don't let me put you to any trouble. With all the time in the world, sir, all the time in the world, and all this is nothing but a lot of nonsense. I live on my nerves a lot, you see, sir. And you entertain me greatly with the witness of your observation. Sometimes I really begin to wobble like a piece of India rubber. And it goes on for half an hour at a stretch. I laugh easily, you see, sir. Being built the way I am, I am sometimes afraid I shall have an attack of palsy. Oh, but do sit down. What's the matter? Please. Otherwise, I shall think you are angry with me. And do put down that cap. Anyone would think that you were just about to leave. It really makes me feel uncomfortable just to look at you. As I said, I am really very pleased you are here. What's his game? Does he really think he'll distract my attention with this stupid chat of his? Um, I can't give you coffee. There aren't facilities for it here. But why not just sit with a friend for five minutes or so to pass time? And you know, all these juridical responsibilities of mine. As regards these responsibilities of mine here, these questioning uh, and all the rest of that formal business, why you yourself were talking about being questioned just now. But what good are formal methods? You know, in many cases, formal methods are just rubbish. Sometimes one gains more from simply having a friendly chat. The work of an investigator is, in its own way, one of the liberal arts, as it were. Oh, something very near it, you see. Porfiry Petrovich stopped for a moment in order to get his breath back. He had been babbling on persistently in a stream of empty and meaningless phrases, into which he would suddenly insert a few enigmatic words, only to slip back at once into meaningless verbiage again. He had almost been running about the room, moving his fat little legs ever more swiftly, looking constantly at the floor, his right arm behind his back, while he waved his left arm ceaselessly in the air, performing various gestures, which were invariably quite out of keeping with what he was saying. Raskolnikov suddenly noticed that on a couple of occasions, as he raced the room, he had seemed to pause beside the door for a moment, as though he were listening. What's he doing? Waiting for something? Yes, 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 sir. There I am going on about formalities again. I mean, suppose I think, or suspect rather, that this, that, or the other person who is involved in some case that has been entrusted to me is guilty of having committed a crime. Uh, you are studying law, Rodion Romanovich, uh, aren't you? Yes, so um, rather I was. Well then, here's a little example for you. One that you might like to keep in mind for the future. Oh, please don't think that I dream of trying to teach you anything. Why, not in view of all these articles on crime you've been publishing. No, 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 sir. But let me put before you just one small example. Uh, in the form of a case study, as it were. For example, suppose I consider this, that, or the other person to be guilty of having committed a crime. Well, why, I ask, should I inconvenience the fellow before I need to, even though I have got evidence against him, sir? Why shouldn't I let him run around town for a while? 
Huh? I know that he is already on my plate and won't abscond. It's not just that he won't abscond because he has nowhere to run to. He won't abscond psychologically. You see? A law of nature will prevent him from getting away from me, even though he has somewhere to run to. Have you ever watched a moth near a candle flame? Well, that's the way he'll be with me, hovering, circling around me like a moth at a lighted candle. He'll lose his taste for freedom. He'll start to think, get tangled in his thoughts, ensnare himself all round as though in some net or other, worry himself to death, and on he will go, performing a circular orbit around me, narrowing the radius further and further. He'll pop, he'll fly straight into my mouth, and I'll swallow him whole. Most gratifying, sir. <laughs> Do you believe me? Raskolnikov made no reply. He sat pale and motionless, staring into Parfiri's face with the same look of tension. Welcome to another edition of Russian Book World, the weekly show on books from and about Russia with me, Elena Rubinova. Many call Dostoevsky a genius. Others consider him a prophet rather than just a writer. But decade after decade, his literary brilliance continues to capture the hearts and minds of millions and in many languages. This is exactly the reason why every new translation of Dostoevsky into English becomes an event, both for readers and for professionals. Ever since publication of Crime and Punishment in 1866, the novel has intrigued readers and tested translators. Dostoevsky has been translated into English many times over the past century, and only for Crime and Punishment I counted at least half a dozen of translations. The classical translation by Constance Garnett dominated for more than 80 years after its publication in 1914. But translators often suffer uneasy afterlife, and Garnett translations from Russian received both praise and criticism. In our times, the race to translate Drostoevsky continues to spark debates, if not feuds. Since early 1990s, two translations have become major competitors of the classical Garnett's version. One by David Macduff and another one by Americans Richard Peaver and Larissa Walachonsky. Their version of 1992 has earned a good reputation from the reader, while Macduff's translation was criticized for being over melodramatic in manner and a bit dry. Nevertheless, both versions are still very popular and sold in thousands and thousands of copies a year. On the 27th of February, the new translation of Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment was released by Penguin Classics. The author of the new translation is Dr. Oliver Reddy. He is a research fellow in Russian society and culture at St. Anthony's College, Oxford. Last week, I went to London to meet Oliver Reddy and to attend the pre-launch of the book organized by Pushkin House. I'm very happy to introduce the guest of Russian Book World today. Oliver, welcome to the Russian Book World. Thank you, Elena. It's a pleasure to be on Voice of Russia again. Oliver, you started translating Crime and Punishment in 2009, so it took longer than four years, quite a long time for anyone's life, not only speaking about translation. What did it feel for you to live with Dostoevsky's texts for so long? 
Well, if I can say so, it's quite a Russian question. Many Russians, while I've been working on this book, have said, what is it like to be with, you know, to be sharing mental space with Dostoevsky for so many years? And as if, as if one would somehow be infected by Dostoevsky's madness or something. And for me, it hasn't been like that at all. I mean, it's been a, a pleasure. And it's also been a very dramatic period in my life because I started a family. I had two children during this, this process. And as any parent knows, even in the best of circumstances, that is always quite dramatic and draining. And actually, the, to have this translation as a sort of ongoing project that I could think about and have as, as sort of refuge in some ways has been immensely a real sort of support for me, a sort of so something I've always something I've always wanted to do. And uh, and I mean, I've been very fortunate that I've been working in institutions and for people who haven't hurried me, and so I've been able to take. I mean, I've been doing other things at the same time, but nevertheless, I've been able to really do several drafts. I mean, I think I'm unusual, apart from anything else, in that I wrote out, I wrote it out by hand in the first instance, which nowadays is it's not something I've ever done in any other case. But but for some reason, I wanted to get away from computers, and so as you can see, it's been it's been a long process, and it's the first time I've translated a classic really on this scale. I've always I've usually translated untranslated literature, and um, translating something that hasn't been translated before is is more liberating in the sense you don't feel this pressure of previous versions. But I, w I was able to get that kind of space of relaxed and sort of personal proximity to the text, yeah. In Russia, we read Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment at school as part of school curriculum and then studiously avoid this novel. And in general, m many people do not go back to Dostoevsky until much later in their life. In my understanding, in the West, Dostoevsky is a literary icon which is highly revered, isn't it? Well, he's not highly revered by everybody. I mean, I think he, he's one of these litmus test writers or, or, or what some people will uh, revere. Well, not revere, but some people will be in awe of his genius. Um, other people will, will say, you know, this is, if this is Golden Age Russian literature, it's only just, it's the lowest form of it. And, you know, Dostoevsky was, you know, used language, they will say, in a negligent way. And um, there are popularist elements in his novels, etc. And, of course, Vladimir Nabokov's opinion on Dostoevsky. So <laughs> but he was also, I mean, I, I describe Nabokov as Dostoevsky's most ungrateful reader, because there's so much of Dostoevsky in Nabokov, in the way Nabokov plays with the reader, in his use of violence, in his themes. Uh, obviously, the style is completely different, but I'm not the first to say that he had a huge debt to, to Dostoevsky. So I don't think he's the best advocate of an anti-Dostoevsky position. But, but I think his lecture on Dostoevsky did influence me when I was an undergraduate. It's only with this translation that I've come to appreciate Dostoevsky as an artist. And that that's really been my discovery from, for myself, I mean, while working on this book, what he does with language and the remarkable way that the remarkable linguistic intricacy of, of the novel, the way certain words are repeated in, with different meanings, but in different mouths and with, you know, in different contexts. And somehow as a, as a translator, you need to try to find something which will f join them in the same way in English. Dostoevsky has been translated into English many times over the past century. I think only for Crime and Punishment I counted half a dozen translations. What can you tell me about your immediate predecessors on this path? The most recent translations is actually a generation ago. Two came out at the same time. Sorry. One by David Macduff in Penguin Classics, which is still in print, and the one by Richard Pavir and Larissa Volochonsky. I'm not an expert on the previous translations, and I'm also not going to pretend that I haven't looked at them. I certainly have looked at them, especially when I was editing my translation. But um, what I did do at the beginning of the process was to compare very closely the first chapter of this novel, which is a formidably difficult chapter to translate well. And I compared very closely Constance Garnett's version, David Macduff's version, Pavir and Volochonsky's version, just in, in some ways to help me formulate more specifically my own distinctive approach, in some ways to see what the problems were and what needed to be thought about most of all. And I, I found that a very useful exercise right at the beginning. Um, I then tried to put aside the translations until I'd... And go from go, 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 go. Yeah, once I'd really decided what I was trying to do with it, as much as possible, sometimes the temptation is too strong to see how one particular word has been rendered and you do consult. But on the whole, I didn't consult. And then I, as I say, once I'd finished, I felt... You know, this is a new translation. It, it would be silly if it appeared with misunderstandings, misreadings that could be solved by looking at other translations and realizing, oh no, I've misunderstood that and I need to go and think about my version again. So I so did. So it was I, like self check. <laughs> yes, um, but, I, but I haven't read any of the other translations from beginning to end, and I, there are many that I haven't looked at at all, so I, I can't say that I'm an expert on the previous translations. But um, certainly Dostoevsky has become a very interesting focus of translation studies and how we, how we approach a classic text. <laughs> Russian Book World. Welcome back to Russian Book World. 
I'd like to remind to our listeners that today we are discussing the new translation of Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment with Dr. Oliver Reddy, scholar, literary critic and translator who was the guest of our studio in London. Oliver, were you trying to modernize Dostoevsky's language to bring him closer to the younger audience? And what language resources did you use? No, I, I certainly didn't want to translate in, into a language, a linguistic register, which is really specifically of now or of the last 10 years, apart from anything else, because the translation would date very quickly if you, if you did that. I also didn't want a vintage translation where I was trying to model my translation on, uh, I don't know, Dickens or, or Stevenson or, or whoever, although I did find it useful to read some of those writers in the English tradition who were either influenced by or inspired by Dostoevsky, like Stevenson or like uh, later on Cooper Powers, and, and just to use their English as, 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 to give me ideas. But the language I, th I think I've ended up using is, is somewhere between Dostoevsky's time and ours. My, I mean, the readers at the publishing house tell me it sounds modern, but I don't think they mean it sounds really trendy or contemporary. I think they mean it has a, a kind of energy which uses, you know, the linguistic resources that have been opened up to us in, since Dostoevsky's time. I mean, I, as a translator, you want to use all of the resources at your disposal to some extent. You, you've got so much ground to make up that it's a shame to close the door completely to this or that resource. Well, well, one rule I had was that the Oxford English Dictionary is very useful when you're translating because it tells you when a particular word is first used or the dictionary has first recorded its use. And generally, I tried not to use words that had appeared for the first time after about 1960, 1950, 1960. So I imagine that the rhythm is quite is more modern than that, but the actual words used are probably somewhere mid-20th century or slightly earlier. In the essay you published in Times Literary Supplements, you call Crime and Punishment a profoundly self-reflexive novel. What does it mean on a textual level for a translator and for a reader? Uh, yes. <laughs> no, no, I remember I used the word self-reflexive. I, I, it's not a very beautiful word, but I was trying to place this novel in a way that it's not often been thought of as a novel in which characters are trapped in literature themselves to some extent. And, and that, that tradition that goes back to Don Quixote, in which in Russian literature, in Yevgeny Anyegin, um, and it's not so obvious in Crime and Punishment, but it's very much there that Raskolnikov is a sort of man of texts in different ways. And he, straight after his crime, he goes to the cafe and he flicks through newspapers and he's always looking for textual corroborations of different kinds. And the theme of literaturnost or sort of literature centeredness is important, very, very important to Dostoevsky. And I think it's right there in the novel. And what it means as a translator, well, when I was talking before about the intricacy of the way Dostoevsky uses particular words, there are certain words, for example, like the word a test, which is both the test that Raskolnikov does, he does a kind of rehearsal of the murder, mm -hmm. and that's called his proba. Um, but then his first article is also called the proba, proba pira. So that these way, a test of the it's pen, like a, a test, a, a, a literary, a literary <laughs> debut. These aren't plays on words. They're ways in which there's a part, aspect of Dostoevsky's genius that he uses the same word to knit together these different levels of the text and to show that there is some connection between action, the murder, etc., and this sort of literary, um, self-reflexive level of the text that is a novel about literature to some extent. Also, also the fact that the reader, it's reflective in a different way. The key scenes in the reader, the most exciting mm -hmm. scenes of the novel, are between Porfiry Petrovich, the investigator, and Raskolnikov. And Porfiry is playing a sort of cat-and-mouse game with Raskolnikov. He's not letting on how much he knows about his crime. He's saying very paradoxical things, and um, he's, he's using words in a, what he calls a double-edged way. And so you have this detective, but Dostoevsky is also asking the reader to be a detective in different ways and to try to interpret these double-edged words, these ambigu ambiguities throughout the novel. And for a translator, you can imagine the translator even more than the reader has to be a detective and a sort of literary critic and has to try to you know, understand in certain situations where the English can't carry exactly the same ambivalence as the Russian. You have to make a choice and you have to, certain, you have to come down one, one side or the other. At the pre-launch of the book at Pushkin House, Oliver Reddy read from his new translation. The abstract presented gives a clear idea that Penguin Classics' website did not exaggerate when saying that the new translation gave a renewed vitality to Dostoevsky's masterpiece. Almost there now. Here was the house. Here were the gates. Suddenly, somewhere, a clock struck once. What? Half past seven already? Impossible. The clock must be fast. His luck held. This archway proved straightforward, too. In fact, at that very instant, as if on purpose, a massive hay cart entered the gates just in front of him, shielding him completely as he passed under the arch. And as soon as the cart emerged into the courtyard, he instantly slipped off to the right. Over there, on the other side of the cart, several voices could be heard shouting and arguing. But no one noticed him, 
and no one crossed his path. Many of the windows that looked down on this enormous square courtyard were open at that moment, but he didn't lift his head. He hadn't the strength. The old woman's staircase was close by, directly off to the right after the arch. And as soon as the cart emerged into the courtyard, he instantly slipped off to the right. Over there, on the other side of the cart, several voices could be heard shouting and arguing. But no one noticed him, and no one crossed his path. Many of the windows that looked down on this enormous square courtyard were open at that moment. But he didn't lift his head. He hadn't the strength. The old woman's staircase was close by, directly off to the right, after the arch. Here he was, already on the stairs. After catching his breath and pressing his hand to his thumping heart, after feeling for the axe and adjusting it one more time, he began climbing the stairs, warily and softly, constantly straining his ears. But the staircase, too, was completely empty at that time. All the doors were shut. He met precisely no one. True, there was one empty apartment on the second floor with the doors flung open and decorators working inside, but they didn't so much as glance in his direction. He stood still for a moment, pondered, and walked on. Of course, it would be better if they weren't here at all, but there's another two floors to go. And here it was, the fourth floor, the door, the apartment opposite, the empty one. To all appearances, the third floor apartment right under the old woman's was also empty. The visiting card nailed to the door was gone, then moved. He was struggling to breathe. Perhaps I should leave, suddenly occurred to him. But he left his own question unanswered and put his ear to the door of the old woman's apartment. Dead silence. Next weekend, we'll continue to explore Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment in new translation by Oliver Reddy. The program was presented by Elena Rubinova. I'd like to remind to our listeners that if you missed any of our programs, they can be downloaded from voiceofrussia.com. And for now, bye-bye. Hello and welcome to Russian Book World, the weekly show on books from and about Russia with me, Elena Rubinova. On February 27th, the new translation of Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment was released by Penguin Classics. And today we continue to discuss with our guest Dr. Oliver Reilly, a translator, critic, literary scholar and the author of the translation, what challenges he faced while working on the new translation version for more than four years. One of the challenges was the roughness of Dostoevsky's language, the repetitions and echoes that are a hallmark of his prose. To explain in more details how specific Dostoevsky's treat of the language is, I'd like to quote from the essay by Joseph Brodsky he wrote in 1980. Dostoevsky made the most of Russian's irregular grammar. His sentences have a feverish, hysterical, idiosyncratic pace, and their lexical content is an all but maddening fusion of belle letters, colloquialisms, and bureaucraties. His discretions were prompted more by the language than by the requirements of a plot. Reading him simply makes one realize that stream of consciousness springs out not from consciousness, but from a word which alters or redirects one's consciousness. I asked Oliver Reddy what specific difficulties it posed to him as a translator. I agree with some of what Brodsky says. I don't agree with the implication of what he's saying, that the language carries the writer away. As in, I think it's an exaggeration, and it's, it's often said about Dostoevsky, it's often said about Gogol, it's often said about Platon, of almost as if these writers are shamans and language speaks through them. But these writers have you know, immense artistic control, and that's why they are great writers. And Dostoevsky doesn't know, knew what he was doing, and he, he's not just letting language speak through him, he's manipulating language, and he's manipulating the reader's reaction. You know, why is it that we feel sorry for Raskolnikov, why do we feel a kind of sympathy for him, why do we feel that he's a good man in some way, and that's, you know, that doesn't happen by chance, it happens because Dostoevsky is in supreme control of how he's using language and how he's structuring it. But I agree with Brodsky about the condensation and, and that's something which in English is often not acknowledged, and people think of Dostoevsky as a great big baggy 19th century writer, and that he's wasting words and that he's verbose, and you know, he is deliberately verbose in some of his longer novels and perhaps sometimes not deliberately for folks, he just, but in, in Crime and Punishment, that he, he doesn't waste words, and that was a principle for me as a translator, that I wanted to keep this tension that Brodsky's talking about. And it's not just a simple tension. I mean, if you just take the very first sentence of Crime and Punishment, 
the language is driving you on. It's dri- you know, there's something tragic is going to happen in this book. There's a sort of forward movement. And against that forward movement, there's Raskolnikov's hesitation. And the first, very first sentence of the book captures both of those things in one extraordinary sentence. And, uh, you know, it took me a very long time to <laughs> get a version that I felt conveyed both of those forces, that sort of tension, that contradiction in English. In other that res- was one of the difficulties. That was one of the difficulties. difficulties. What about others? Well, it's, it's, I mean, one, could, one could take any sentence and, and find difficulties. I mean, there are, I think my aim was to, at, every, at the largest extent possible, convey the expressiveness of Dostoevsky's Russian in English. And a lot of the novel is speech. Some of that speech is taken from Dostoevsky's recent experience in Siberia, where he'd heard a lot of and written down in his notebooks a lot of phrases from convicts he'd been with, often very colourful language. And so when you have that kind of speech, you can't translate too close to the text if you want it to come alive in English. And so to try to, to get the sort of aphoristic brilliance of some of these short phrases, I mean, I wouldn't say difficulty, but, you know, an enjoyable imaginative challenge. That was something I loved about translating the book. Whereas when you have this, the passages of pure narrative, not pure narrative, but third person narrative, you need to, not that you need to stick, stick close to the text, but you need to think very carefully before you depart too much, um, because you might introduce certain connotations, certain notes, which disturb, disturb the text. Then you have certain you know, individual words, like the, the canal runs through the, the main part of the topography of the novel, the Catherine Canal, if we want, uses its formal sounding, European sort of sounding name. But in the novel, it's just, it's not canal, it's canava. And I think by all previous translations I've looked at say this is a canal. Um, but, you know, at the time, this, it was a filthy bit of water that was mainly a kind of sewer. And so I have ditch all the way through. And again, I think that's much more expressive and it's used the way characters use it. They're not just saying a neutral word canal, but this ditch is somehow how symbolic of their own mental surroundings as much as physical surroundings. In my school days, there was a funny phrase uh, that it was a crime not to read crime and punishment and a real punishment if you do. Will the new translation make it easier and more friendly for an English-speaking reader? I I think there has been a similar reaction here. I I was very struck when I was working on it that a letter was written to the Daily Telegraph saying why, you know, Dostoevsky is supposed to be a great writer, etc. Why am I not enjoying reading? I don't know which translation this person was reading, but certainly in my translation, I was trying to not make it easier, not make it more friendly, but by bringing voices alive as much as possible, by making speech sound like actual speech, by making Raskolnikov's interior monologue sound like thoughts that one would actually have, to make it more compelling. And um, one comment I had from one of the editors was that the translation had bounce. I quote that because it's not the highest compliment one, but then I thought about it good, and I thought that is kind of what I want to do. I didn't want the, the reader to feel, oh, we're coming up to a long passage of conversations about utilitarianism and philosophy, and this is where we can skip a few pages. I wanted the conversation, even in these long, quite Victorian passages, to remain interesting and alive and funny, hopefully. I um, mean, I think some of the characters in the middle of the novel, because the novel changes hugely, it has this first very, very intense part of the murder, but then it has bulk of the book, four parts, which where Raskolnikov is not the main character, or he's not on stage all That's the time. True. And people, people always say about mm-hmm. the crime punishment, that you're always in Raskolnikov's mind. You're not at all. Um, for a long time, various other characters come to the forefront. Illusion, or Svidrigailov, or Porfiry. And you could um, play with, and, or, with those characters in, yes, in the Yes, you know, working on their voice, but also on bringing out the humour and the unpredictability of their speech. And that was especially true of Razumikhin, who's Raskolnikov's one friend in the novel, and he's often seen as a sort of rather boring, reasonable man, as his name suggests. Razum, meaning reason. Reason, but he's not. The reason, I mean, he, he is in some ways, but in other ways he gets drunk, he falls in love, he has, he's a sort of his social background is mixed. I mean, he's sort of between classes man, and he's trying to impress you sometimes with his fancy words. Sometimes he's castigating himself. He's not a predictable person. He's not a rational person in many ways. And studying his speech and trying, trying to capture that unpredictability in English was um, something I enjoyed very much and I hope has come across. But it's not for the translator to judge how the translation, for the readers to judge what effect it ultimately has. Russian Book World. Welcome back. You are listening to Radio VR, and I would like to remind that today in Russian Book World, we are discussing the new translation of Crime and Punishment, recently released by Penguin Classics. In this part of the program, we will hear more from the pre-launch of the book at Pushkin House, London, and enjoy another fragment from the new translation presented by the author, Dr. Oliver Reddy. Tell me, what impact this translation and work on this book for so many years had on you? 
It's hard for me to say. I think the one, something I take away from the work is that despite how we think about Dostoevsky being this gloomy writer, I think that there is an enormous amount of hope in his writing and tenderness. And um, Crime and Punishment ends with a scene of, of love, finally. And, and it, as it did for Dostoevsky as a writer, he married his, his stenographer who he had hired in the course of rushing to get the novel finished and to, and to write his other novel that he was writing at the same time, The Gambler. And I, I think I've always found that, certainly as an adult reading Dostoevsky, that... It leaves he, us some hope. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and that there's a very... We see him as a... He is a violent writer. He is a violent writer in terms of what he describes. He's a violent writer in terms of his use of style, the way he brings different voices together, etc. When you're translating, you need to capture all of that. But he's also... A, he also uses understatement as a writer. His humour is often understated. The scenes of love and moments of emotion are understated. And... Um, and I find that, that combination very perpetually interesting, but I find his delicacy in certain passages very, very inspiring. inspiring. That's uh, what yes. you have opened for yourself as a reader. Yes, I think so, yes. And, uh, among among other things, yes. Thank you so much uh, for being with the Russian Book World. You're welcome. In all Dostoevsky's novels, there is an unresolved tension, a tension between believing and not believing in the existence of God. How fiction and faith are intertwined in Dostoevsky's writing. Those and other issues Oliver Reddy discussed at the pre-launch of the book with Dr. Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury and the author of an excellent book, Dostoevsky, Language, Faith and Fiction. Dr. Rowan Williams spoke about spiritual depth of Dostoevsky's writings and explained how the genius of Dostoevsky explored the consequences of modern atheism. First, speaking very specifically as a Christian, I suppose, I'm fascinated by the way in which Dostoevsky pushes the case against his own convictions so very hard. There is intrinsic in all that he writes about faith that deep sense of irony which links him to people like Kierkegaard. It's something to do with the fact that in a late letter he says that he will put the case against Christianity better than any atheist can. And I think that's, that's a very proper thing for a Christian to try to do. And I'm just fascinated by how he does it. But the second thing is a much more literary observation, which is quite simply that I regard him as, in some ways, almost a paradigm novelist. That is, he is somebody who is orchestrating or framing a litany of voices in Bakhtin's great image. He is somebody who refuses to come to easy closures in his treatment of his characters. That very evening, the audience, gathered at the pre-launch of the book at Pushkin House, London, had a chance to hear from the new translation. Then he listened out again for noises below him, listened long and hard. He looked about one last time, straightened and tidied himself up, and tested the axe in the loop once more. Various thoughts crossed his mind. Hope I'm not too pale, not overexcited. She's mistrustful. Perhaps I should wait a bit for my heart to stop. But his heart did not stop. Quite the opposite, as if on purpose, it beat harder, harder and harder. He couldn't resist, slowly stretched his arm out towards the bell and rang. Half a minute later, he rang again, louder. No reply. It was pointless ringing for the sake of it, and unseemly. The old woman, needless to say, was in, but she was suspicious, and she was alone. He knew her habits, and once again he pressed his ear flush against the door. Whether it was the keenness of his senses, which is rather hard to imagine, or whether it really was very audible, but he suddenly heard what sounded like a hand cautiously feathering the lock, and a dress rustling against the door itself. Someone was lurking right by the lock, and just like him here on the outside, was listening hard, crouching, and also, it seemed, pressing an ear to the door. He made a deliberate movement and muttered something rather too loudly to make it clear he wasn't hiding. Then he rang a third time, but softly, calmly, and without the slightest haste. Recalling this afterwards, vividly, clearly, that moment was imprinted on him for all time. He simply could not understand where he'd found such guile, not least because there were moments when his mind seemed to go dark, and as for his body, he could barely feel it. Seconds later, someone could be heard lifting the latch. Tiniest of chinks appeared in the doorway, just like the last time, and two sharp and mistrustful eyes stared out at him once again from the dark. Here, Raskolnikov became flustered and nearly made a serious mistake. Fearing that the old woman would take fright at finding herself alone with him, and far from confident that his appearance would reassure her, he grabbed hold of the door and pulled it towards him, just in case she should think of locking herself in again. Seeing this, she did not yank the door back towards her, 
but nor did she let go of the handle, and he very nearly ended up dragging her out onto the stairs, together with the door. When he saw that she was blocking the doorway and not letting him pass, he walked straight at her. She leapt back in alarm and was on the point of saying something, but didn't seem able to, and stared at him wide-eyed. Oh, he hello, Alyona Ivanovna, he began as casually as he could, but his voice refused to obey him, broke off and began to quiver. I, I have brought you the thing, but why don't we go over here, towards the light? Leaving her there, and without any invitation, he walked straight through into the main room. The old woman ran after him. She had recovered her voice. Good Lord, what is it? Who are you? What do you want? For pity's sake, Alyona Ivanovna, we've met before. Raskolnikov, here, I've brought the pledge I promised you the other day. And he proffered her the pledge. The old woman took one glance at the pledge before immediately fixing her eyes on those of her unbidden guest. She looked at him attentively, with malice and mistrust. A minute or so passed. He even thought he detected a hint of mockery in her eyes, as though she'd already worked everything out. He sensed that he was becoming flustered, that he was almost terrified, so terrified that another half minute of her wordless stare would have been enough to send him running. But why are you staring at me like this, as if you don't recognize me? He suddenly said, also with malice. If you want it, take it. If not, I'll take it elsewhere. I've no time for this. He hadn't meant to say this. The words just came out. The program was presented by Elena Rubinova. I'd like to remind that if you missed any of our programs, they can be downloaded from voiceofrussia.com. Please join us next week, and for now, bye-bye.